1861, as Virginia militia marched through the streets of Charlestown, Virginia, which is now, of course, in West Virginia, en route to Harper's Ferry, there were throngs of civilians, including free blacks and enslaved people, who lined the streets of that lower Shenandoah Valley community, and they watched this, this spectacle unfold. As the troops paraded through the streets of Charlestown, David Hunter Strother, and this is someone that is undoubtedly familiar to many of you, David Hunter Strother, of course, hails from uh, the community where I live now, Martinsburg, West Virginia. And he was a very ardent unionist sympathizer during the war. He served on uh, the staffs of various union generals throughout the course of the conflict. But David Hunter Strother was there that day. And he observed not only the parade, but he was really taking very close look at the reaction of the African-Americans in the crowd. And as he looked at the faces of those free blacks as well as enslaved people, it seemed to him that they had a sense of wonder on their faces, wonder about what all of this ultimately meant to them and to the prospects of them attaining freedom. And he wrote that he thought he could discern in the eyes of some of the older and wiser Negroes a gleam of anxious speculation, a silent and tremulous questioning of the future. Now, in the early months of the Civil War, prior to the arrival of federal troops in the Shenandoah Valley, the Shenandoah Valley's enslaved population, which at the outset of the war was approximately 25,000, they needed to determine how best uh, to use the conflict as an instrument to seize freedom. And, and one of the things that, that you're going to see throughout the course of the presentation this evening is that enslaved people, it really ran the gamut as to what they thought was the best way to achieve freedom, when was the timing correct. And you see this really from the outset of the conflict in the spring of 1861. So there were some individuals who took a really bold approach as in the case of a contingent of 19 enslaved people who on May 26, 1861, attempted to start an uprising, an insurrection in Winchester. Well, Confederate forces under Joseph E. Johnston who occupied the area around Winchester at that moment, they quieted uh, the affair. Three of those individuals involved um, were executed by Confederates and the other 16 were locked up in the Winchester City Jail. Other enslaved people in the war's opening months, they bolted from their enslavers and they headed north for Pennsylvania. And in going through the, the, the research for the book, a real, real small snippet of everything that's in that, that study, but there's a lot of newspaper coverage uh, in the area around Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, in the late spring, early summer of 1861, reporting this regular stream of uh, freedom seekers coming from various locales in the Shenandoah Valley. So, for example, uh, one Harrisburg, Pennsylvania correspondent on June 7th, 1861, noted that on that day, over 100 fugitives from slave labor from the neighborhood of Winchester arrived here on Wednesday and Thursday. Now, these runaways who made it to Harrisburg, they informed reporters that the city of Harrisburg needed to brace itself and needed to prepare itself for an even greater influx as the mountains of Virginia were full of enslaved people who had left their masters and were making their way north. So you have planned insurrection that fails. You have some who are bolting for Pennsylvania. But then there was that contingent of enslaved people at the war's outset who believed that starting an uprising or fleeing masters was a really unwise decision with such a significant presence of Confederate troops in the region. When the war broke out, John Quincy Adams, who was enslaved in Frederick County, he was a child um, at this stage of the game in his life. John Quincy Adams, as about a 10 or 11-year-old child, he wanted his entire family to flee at the outset of the war. 
but his father thought that this was a really unwise decision. He wanted to take a much more pragmatic approach. John Quincy Adams's father wanted to wait for the situation to stabilize. He didn't think it was ideal to flee with Confederate forces in the area. And he thought that if we wait for that most opportune moment, we're going to have a better chance of successfully escaping the institution of slavery and starting a better life. Now, interestingly, the decision of enslaved people to be pragmatic, to wait for that best, that most opportune moment to flee, it interestingly gave some enslavers the belief that their enslaved people were not fleeing when others were leaving the Shenandoah Valley. They enjoyed their life. And I think anyone with any degree of, of, of common sense really can, can understand how uh, just absolutely laughable that claim is. And we're going to talk uh, at, at some great length this evening about loyalty um, and ultimately what, what that means. But again, I, I think it's important to understand that what an enslaver is perceiving as loyalty to them is actually loyalty on the part of the enslaved person to themselves or to their families, wanting to put themselves into the best position possible to be successful in securing freedom that ultimately that kept them like the Adamses with their enslavers in the early months of the conflict. So the supposed loyalty that John Quincy Adams is uh, enslavers, the Calamese family of Frederick County, they might have believed the Adamses possessed, it vanished. Because in the summer of 1862, when General John Geary's forces uh, were in the lower valley for a very, very brief stint of time, the Adamses bolted and left and made their way to Pennsylvania. For some of the Shenandoah Valley's enslaved, it seemed really that the first best opportunity that they would have to flee came with the approach of Union General Robert Patterson's army to the region in mid-June of 1861. Now, whether or not enslaved people in the valley were cognizant of the refuge that Union General Benjamin Butler offered runaway slaves at Fortress Monroe in May of 1861 or not is, is uncertain. But as Patterson's command made its way down from uh, southern Pennsylvania into Maryland, and eventually on into Jefferson County, Virginia. It did not take long for the area enslaved people to seek refuge with Patterson's army. As soldiers from the 2nd Massachusetts Infantry passed through Smithfield in June, there was an enslaved male who approached the regiment and he asked, and I'm quoting now, if this was not the army that was come to set them free. So there was this expectation. There was this belief that the soldiers in blue were going to come here and they were going to set all enslaved people free. Well, the response of this Massachusetts soldier was somewhat shocking. And the response was, no, my man, we have come here solely to execute the laws. To set you free or to do anything contrary to the law of the land is not our mission. And what this soldier ultimately did was he encouraged those enslaved people to return to their enslavers. So this is a very confusing situation. Similar interactions between members of Patterson's army and area enslaved people continued on a daily basis during Patterson's command tenure in the Valley, which ended on July 20, 1861. But it's important to note that not all soldiers in Patterson's army approved of his policy of either refusing to help enslaved people or as Patterson's and Union military policy dictated in the spring of 1861 to return enslaved people to owners or imprison them until their enslavers could be identified. Now, some of Patterson's men believed that it was not only morally objectionable to do so, but ultimately that it was, that it was militarily unwise. It was just a very dumb stance uh, to take. And one of the individuals who was in the valley at this time, who is undoubtedly known to many, if not all of you uh, on the presentation this evening, is Robert Gould Shaw, who at this moment in the conflict was a lieutenant in the 2nd Massachusetts. And he thought that employing these freedom seekers, 
as as uh, as detectives, as playing a role in intelligence gathering, as teamsters, and above all, as soldiers, that put, using their energy, using them as a great human resource, that this would restore the union more expeditiously. And Shaw wrote that the Lincoln administration needed to make use of the instrument that would finish the war sooner than anything else, the slaves. I have no doubt that they could give more information about the enemy than anyone else. What a lick it would be at them, meaning the Confederates, to call on all the blacks in the country to come and enlist in our army. Now, while the federal government was certainly not yet prepared to arm African Americans, there were some individuals in Patterson's command who ultimately believed that uh, his directives on runaway slaves were simply asinine. And they did all that they could to help and aid those freedom seekers. When a contingent of enslaved people sought refuge with the second Massachusetts near Harper's Ferry in late July, the regiment's Major Wilder Dwight, he knew that although it was in defiance to General Patterson's orders, it went against my grain, as he wrote, to throw obstacles in their way. Now, although it kept, again, with Union military policy. Patterson's practice of returning or incarcerating enslaved people, it did not sit well, certainly, with the anti-slave leaning members of Congress. And so on July 8th, 1861, abolitionist Congressman Elijah Lovejoy introduced a resolution in the House of Representatives condemning practices such as Patterson's and urged his colleagues in the House to pass a resolution that would shift Union policy away from returning these runaway slaves. Well, one month later, on August the 6th, Congress passed and President Lincoln signed the first Confiscation Act, which stated that all property, including enslaved people, used to support the Confederate war effort were to be declared lawful subject of prize and capture were ever found by Union soldiers. Now, several weeks prior to the passage of this first Confiscation Act, Federal authorities in Washington, they relieved Patterson. They placed General Nathaniel P. Banks in command of the troops in the valley. And as troops arrived at Harper's Ferry in the wake of that first Confiscation Act and Patterson's removal, you started to see an uptick in the amount of enslaved people who were coming in to Union lines at Harper's Ferry. Now, even though you had an improved policy and you had a Union general who supported slavery destruction, saw it as a good thing. It's important to note that the individuals who are coming into General Banks' lines in the vicinity of Harper's Ferry, those individuals are coming from the local environment around Harper's Ferry. So proximity basically dictates how likely you are at really any point in the conflict to flee to Union armies. So, you know, one of the things that, that I looked at and I, was, I, I tried to track as best as possible is looking at the reports that were filed with Banks' command late 61, the early part of 1862, of contraband slaves. And if you look, for instance, at the numbers in February and March of 1862, it shows that 60% of the enslaved people who ventured to Harper's Ferry came from Jefferson County. So Harper's Ferry, of course, sits in Jefferson County, with the remaining 40% coming from those nearby adjacent counties of Clark, Berkeley, and Frederick. So you don't yet have individuals from Rockingham County or Augusta County or Rockbridge County in the southern part of the Shenandoah Valley. Now, with enslaved people arriving on a daily basis, General Banks's command uh, recorded their names, names of enslavers, and why ultimately they fled. And, and, I, and I tell my students about this, this moment digging through General Banks's papers in the National Archives, which is where these, these things reside. Um, you're supposed to be quiet when you're in an archive doing research. And I had one of these kind of yippy moments because I couldn't believe that individuals um, had just completely overlooked this uh, for so many years. And, and when you look at this previously untapped resource, 
what it essentially is offering, it is tantamount to oral history interviews with runaway slaves at the moment they ran away. And so, you know, if, if you've ever tried to reconstruct the life of, of enslaved people, it's a very difficult thing to do because you don't have the, the plethora of, of primary source material, the letters and the diaries that you do with, with white soldiers, for instance. And so, you know, we do have some published uh, accounts from John Quincy Adams, uh, the individual I mentioned earlier, from uh, Elizabeth Vini, but most of, of, you know, our knowledge of what it was like, slavery comes from those WPA slave narratives that were done uh, in the 1930s. So to have this, this source of these interviews that are being done in late 61, 62, uh, I think it's, it's really uh, a remarkable, remarkable resource. So some of the enslaved people who arrived at Harper's Ferry, such as a 10-year-old uh, boy simply identified in the record as Ned, informed Union soldiers he fled because, and I'm quoting now, his master whipped him. Uh, another runaway, Edmund Cook, told Union authorities that his master, Abraham Isler, knocks me around and abuses me unmercifully. Other individuals brought with them not only accounts of slavery's brutality, but they also brought with them information about what Confederate forces in the vicinity of Winchester. So, you know, if you're looking at late 61, early 62, these are those forces commanded by Stonewall Jackson. So they're bringing information about Jackson's army and what the defenses of Winchester are like. Uh, Dennis Taylor, who escaped his enslaver who lived a few miles north of Winchester, when he arrived at Harper's Ferry, he told General Banks' uh, officers about the, the fortifications that had been constructed north of town and how Jackson was strengthening those things. And specifically, he refers to Fort Collier. So if any of you are, are on this call who, who have been, you know, who have toured the, the battles of Winchester or are familiar with that area, Fort Collier is a significant historic site to the third battle. Well, Dennis Taylor gives a, a, a wonderful account of what he saw at Fort Collier in early part of 1862. And he told Banks's officers that he had seen the fort on Stein's farm and that it contained large guns between two banks, banks made of flour barrels with dirt thrown against them. And he also informed uh, federal soldiers at Harper's Ferry that Jackson was constructing earthworks on and along the Berryville Pike. And all of this information, of course, was exceedingly useful to General Banks as he's beginning to make his way toward Winchester um, in that second week of March. Now, as Banks was moving south toward Winchester during that second week, white Confederate civilians in Winchester and Frederick County, they were really uh, preparing themselves, bracing themselves for the first of what became many uh, United States occupations of the city. They didn't know what federal soldiers were going to do when they came into Winchester, and so they were trying to hide as many valuable possessions as possible. But there was one valuable possession they could not hide, and that was the human beings whom they enslaved. Laura Lee, uh, she wrote about this in her diary, March 11th, 1862, which is the day that Jackson evacuates. And she wrote that we were busy putting into place of safety Silver, paper, swords, flags, military clothes, war letters, in short, everything contraband, except the servants who could not be conveniently stored away. As General Banks occupied Winchester, the number of slaves who fled to Union lines increased dramatically with each passing day. Among those individuals who fled to Banks's command was a 21-year-old uh, individual named Moses Williams. He was one of five enslaved people who bolted from uh, who bolted for Winchester from his enslaver Samuel Cook in Warren County. When Williams arrived in Winchester, he informed Union soldiers there, and I'm quoting now, "Master is very cruel. 
did not feed us well, worked us hard, whipped us undeservedly. It's important to note that while you have these throngs of enslaved people fleeing to Winchester, you also have free blacks who are coming to Winchester seeking refuge with Banks's army as well. When Jackson withdrew from Winchester on March the 11th, he arrested scores of white male unionists and he seized an undeterminable number of enslaved people and free blacks. In some way, into the Confederacy's service. And among the free blacks who were seized by Jackson were John Williams Martin and Sylvester Jordan. So as Martin and Jordan were being pushed south with the Confederate army, it became pretty clear to them what Jackson intended to do with them, to impress them, to use them as slave labor. And Martin and Jordan were not gonna have any part of this. And so they bolted at the first opportunity for Winchester, they arrived there on March the 16th. When they arrived in Winchester, Jordan, 35 years old at the time, he informed Union officials that Confederates, quote unquote, took me away. There were other free blacks, such as James Sestro, who was from Strasburg, Virginia. He hadn't been captured by Jackson yet, but he was fearful that he might. And so he thought, I better get out of Strasburg and make my way to the safety of. Winchester. Now, for I think so many of those enslaved people, Winchester was not a final destination, but merely a stepping stone on their path northward. Newspapers from around Philadelphia reported scores of freedom seekers arriving on a daily basis from the Shenandoah Valley. One correspondent wrote that as many as a hundred have arrived in a single week. Some reach our borders without shoes, their feet torn and bloody by tramping over frozen roads, no hats for some, no shorts for, shirts for others, and as for food, emaciated from anxiety and famine, for they have traveled by night and had no money with which to purchase food. Now, although the area around Philadelphia became a new home, numbers of formerly enslaved humans from the Shenandoah Valley, those individuals who settled there, they never lost sight of the fact that there were still significant numbers of individuals trying to find their way out, trying to look for that most opportune moment, and that they had enormous struggles, almost seemingly insurmountable obstacles to overcome. So cognizant of the challenges that these contrabands confronted, if they remained in Virginia, or would encounter if they continued northward. There were a group of 27 formerly enslaved people who bolted from the area around Harper's Ferry and now called Philadelphia home. They actually organized a relief association that sent clothing to contrabands who remained in the Shenandoah Valley. For those individuals who remained, General Banks mandated that they needed to labor for the Union war effort. Now, Banks' approach, of course, this was not a new one. Since the conflict broke out um, and enslaved people were bolting to Union lines, Union generals were searching for efficient, cost-effective methods to provide basic necessities to these enslaved people. Banks employed them working for the quartermaster department. He employed some, as I alluded to earlier, in intelligence gathering. Now, as General Banks pushed south toward Harrisonburg in pursuit of Jackson in the end of March, the number of enslaved people who fled their enslavers and joined Banks' column increased. And it became clear to General Banks and to all of the soldiers in his army that they were ready to do what was necessary to support, to labor for the Union war effort. From a camp near Newmarket, the chaplain of the second Massachusetts, Alonzo Quinn, he wrote, all tell the same story, all desire to be free, all seem ready to work for the Union cause. As Union forces moved south that spring, they began to witness firsthand the brutality that some enslavers exhibited toward those whom they enslaved. 
south of Middletown, near the banks of Cedar Creek, there were a contingent of New York soldiers who encountered an enslaved man. And they had this, this conversation with him. And he informed that group of New Yorkers that his life, and I'm, I'm quoting now, that his life was very hard at times and that he had been badly whipped. So this enslaved man further shared that he thought he could feel, he never could see these, but he could feel these these thick places, these thick ridges on his back where he had been whipped at various moments in his life. And at first, the New Yorkers didn't believe this. They thought maybe he was exaggerating, embellishing a little bit. And so they asked him to take off his shirt. And what they confronted appalled them. This is not a photograph of that individual. It would be great if we had a photograph, but we don't. But this gives you a sense of what they are looking at. And this is something that these New Yorkers, they had heard about, they had read about, but they had never seen it on the back of a human being before. And one soldier wrote, we had all read of scarred backs, but this surpassed all description. It was one continuous scar and the ridges thick as our fingers, which the whip had made, cross it in all directions. Interactions such as this I think, and I argue this in the book, I think it had a transformative effect on the minds of some Union soldiers. And I think it's no secret that there are Union soldiers, probably the majority of them, who at the outset of the war, they harbored animosity to this notion of transforming the war for Union into a war to bring about the annihilation of slavery. But then you have interactions, then you have experiences like the one that I've just described. Alonzo Quint, that chaplain who I introduced you to earlier, he wrote that he never fancied himself as an abolitionist. He knew that was wrong, but he really didn't have this, this militant desire to bring about its destruction until he came to the Valley in late 61 and early 62. And he started to undergo this, this personal transformation as to what Union armies should be doing to bring about slavery's demise. After encountering slavery up close and personal during that spring of 1862, during that march southward, Alonzo Quint wrote, Slave, slaveholding is the sin. It perverts the conscience, warps the intellect, brutalizes the heart. Believe no such nonsense as that the slaves are contented. They long to be free. Nor is there any difficulty in settling the slave question so far as our armies go. Although untold numbers of enslaved people, they fled that spring, there were still some individuals who held reservations about whether or not the timing was right. As the campaign ebbed and flowed in the valley that April and May, there were rumors that were circulating among enslaved people that Jackson was murdering every single black person he could find as he advanced northward. One resident of Frederick County noted their greatest panic among the servants. The Yankees have assured them that Jackson is murdering all the Negroes as he advances, even cutting the throats of the babies in their cradles. Now, there's, there's no evidence I was able to find to corroborate these reports. But I think it's important to understand that whether or not Jackson was doing it, perception was reality. If you believed that these things were happening, that was the reality of the situation for you. And so that's why then on the morning of May 25th, as Jackson attacked banks at Winchester, that hundreds, if not thousands of enslaved people who remained in Winchester packed up what little belongings they possessed and they dashed north. There were some individuals who were successful in their escape. Among them was the 17-year-old George Cook, who fled with his family, his mother, his father, and six brothers and sisters. And eventually they made it into Pennsylvania. And Cook went on to do great things. You see a photograph of him there on the screen. This is him, uh, obviously, much later in life. 
but he graduated from Howard University as valedictorian in 1881, spent the next 58 years of his life working at Howard University in a variety of academic posts, including Dean. So George Cook and his family, this is a success story. But you have some individuals who end up being killed in their attempt to flee. When the opening salvos of the first battle of Winchester sounded in those early hours of May 25th, there was an African-American woman, whether she was enslaved or free, we can't say for certain, but she gathered up her children, three children. She lived near Camp Hill, which if you're familiar with Winchester, isn't far from the university campus. And just as she was getting ready to turn north to head out of Winchester, an artillery shell landed in her midst and killed her and her children. There were some in the northern outskirts of Winchester, but ended up being captured by Confederates. And then you have some individuals who fled safely north. They got several miles north of Winchester. And then they stopped. Some stopped because they were exhausted. Others stopped because they didn't know what to do. Where were they going to go? How were they going to provide for themselves? And they remarkably, defying our logic, they turned around and returned to Winchester. Among those individuals who returned, and this, I think, is a, a remarkable story, again, that underscores the, the complexity of, of loyalty, as I mentioned earlier, was an enslaved man named Manuel. So Manuel was enslaved by Winchester's McDonald family. So if you're, again, familiar with Winchester, Cornelia McDonald, uh, one of the so-called devil diarists of Winchester, her husband, Angus McDonald, um, she, she recorded this, this, what we would think is a very odd set of events that occurs. So Manuel fled the McDonald home during the early part of Banks's occupation in March of 1862. He worked for him for the next few months as a teamster. And as Banks was being driven out of Winchester, he's driving that wagon and he gets several miles north of Winchester and he stops, gets off the wagon and he's thinking about my loved ones, thinking about the individual's who I've left behind, especially his wife, Catherine, and his two children. So he stopped and he came back. Now, ultimately, he ended up hiding out at first in a little cottage on Piccadilly Street. Cordelia McDonald found out about this, and there was, a, there was an interaction between Manuel and Cornelia McDonald. And in her diary, she writes that at first, Manuel seemed so repentant. He was sorry for having fled in the first place. And I think while individuals who, who favor a, a lost cause interpretation of the war, and they might like to, to draw on the story of Manuel to bolster um, that ever-present myth of the loyal, happy slave, I think the story's totality destroys that happy slave mythology. Manuel returned not out of loyalty to his enslaver, but loyalty to, his, to himself and to his wife, to his wife. And McDonald, she seemed, she seemed assured, and if you read her diary, it's pretty clear that Emmanuel said he's never going to flee again. Well, he did just that in September of 1862, when Union General Julius White evacuated Winchester for Harper's Ferry. Manuel, Catherine, and their children commandeered the McDonald's carriage. They hastened to freedom, never to be heard from again. Throughout 1862, the enslaved population in the valley as Manuel's story represents, they navigated a complex environment. They made decisions which to some, again, to us in the 21st century might just deceive logic. But even after President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation took effect on New Year's Day, 1863, it started stories later in Winchester, at least uh, in Winchester and the lower Shenandoah Valley counties by Union General Robert Milroy, who on the 5th day of January issued that document. You see there on the right side of the screen, freedom to slaves. Enslaved people still struggled with whether or not they should flee or remain. So this kind of hammers home the point that emancipation on paper, yes, it might have come at that one moment, January 1st, 1863. Or you can make the argument that 
for the valley it came at that moment on January the 5th, when Milroy puts up freedom to slaves all over the lower part of the Shenandoah Valley. But in reality, emancipation, and I argue this throughout the book, it is gradual, it is an individual decision, and there are some individuals who are emancipated to return to slavery, emancipated to return to slavery, they go through this process on several occasions. The desire to be free was always there. But that decision to flee is always compounded by considerations of where are we going? How are we going to survive? Where are we going to get work? Where are we going to get money? What might happen to family members or friends who I am leaving behind? Throughout the first six months of 1863, and General Milroy's enforcement of emancipation in the Lower Shenandoah Valley. Milroy hoped that African Americans would remain, they would live, and they would work in the Shenandoah Valley. And he, he wrote in his uh, letter to his wife back in Indiana, I try to persuade them to remain in Virginia, assuring them that they will remain free. But those assurances carried little weight with some individuals. They had seen the constant ebb and flow, the uncertain nature of warfare in the valley. And on a daily basis, these now emancipated individuals, they were by wagon to Stevenson's Depot, where they boarded trains that carried them to points north. When his schedule allowed, Milroy ventured to Stevenson's Depot to wish them well. And as a parting gift, he gave all of them a small little carte de vis sized image of John Brown. And Milroy was a great admirer of Brown, and he did not want the valleys enslaved people, now emancipated, to forget Brown, to forget what he attempted to do for them in the autumn of 1859. Of course, it had been the case uh, previously, not all of these individuals left. Just as had occurred during Banks's tenure, those who stayed worked for Milroy's command in a variety of labor tasks, including intelligence gathering. And among those who labored for Milroy in intelligence work was a free black man from what is Stevens City today during the time of the war. It was known as Newtown. His name was Lee Jenkins. On June 15th, 1863, as Confederate General Richard Yule's command um, defeated Milroy's division north of Winchester during the Second Battle. This was a moment that ended emancipation in the region, at least for the time being. Well, you had a chaotic scene, just the, the kind of the, the same scene that had unfolded on May 25th was now unfolding on June 15th, 1863. Some got away, some were captured. Among those who were captured was that 39 year old free black man. Lee Jenkins. Although Lee Jenkins was born free, Confederate captors cared little about his legal status. They judged him by the color of his skin. To those from Ewell's command who captured him, they thought that this was an individual who could be seized, who could be impressed, and labor exploited for the benefit of the Confederacy. Eight days after his capture, Confederate soldiers marched Lee Jenkins and a column of several hundred African-Americans south from Winchester on the Valley Pike. Although Jenkins had never been enslaved, he understood what slavery was about. He saw it every day. And one could only imagine the thoughts that were coursing through Jenkins's mind as the column entered the community where he grew up, where he lived, where he worked as a free man. As he undoubtedly contemplated a life of hard labor, building defenses for the Confederate government. Jenkins, I think, might have also wondered what Confederates would do to him toward his role in intelligence gathering for Milroy. He believed, Jenkins believed that there was only one way to relieve himself from this terrible, terrible situation. As the column approached the southern outskirts of Stephen City, Lee Jenkins broke ranks, ran to the property of Thornton McLeod, jumped headfirst into a well, and killed himself. He thought that death 
was the only reasonable release from the life that awaited him in slavery. As tragic as Lee Jenkins' story is, I think it also reveals another important element of the African American's Civil War story in the Valley. They were active participants in the war for union, in the war for slavery's destruction. They were not just passive bystanders sitting idly by waiting for their liberation. Now, while untold numbers of African Americans labored for the Union war effort, men and women, young and old, performing various labor tasks, including so many that I'd mentioned earlier, you have more than 600 African Americans with ties to the Shenandoah Valley who served in United States color troop regiments once Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation opened the door for the recruitment of African Americans. To the Valley's white Confederate inhabitants, the mere thought of an African American in a Union uniform shouldering a musket, it struck fear and horror into their hearts. When the 19th USCT, a regiment which hailed from the Eastern Shore of Maryland, came to the Lower Valley on a recruiting mission during the first week of April, 1864, the scene of that regiment marching into Winchester, setting up a, a campsite right in front of the market house, which is where City Hall uh, stands today. It appalled these Confederate civilians, including Mary Greenhow Lee, who is one of the, the more well-known of those uh, diarists from the city of Winchester. And this is what she wrote in her diary that day. She said, I was near fainting and more unnerved than by any sight I have seen since the war. There is nothing I have dreaded so much during the war as being where Negro troops were garrisoned. Now, while that particular recruiting mission yielded only two recruits, hundreds of African-American men had already fled the area and enlisted. Among them was Edward Hall, who was born a slave in Jefferson County in 1827, was brought to Winchester um, at the age of seven. In late 1863, Hall left his wife, Ellen, 10-year-old son, Charles, ventured to Maryland and enlisted in Colonel Delavan Bates' 30th USCT. So the 30th USCT was part of General Edward Ferrero's division of the 9th Corps. So this meant that Hall and his regiment fought in some of the fiercest engagements of the war's final year including the Battle of the Crater on July 30th, 1864, and assaults against Fort Fisher in Wilmington, North Carolina. And you see there on the screen, that is Edward Hall's tombstone, what's left of it, in Oryx Cemetery in Winchester. And he is one of two African-American soldiers buried in that cemetery who fought uh, for the Union Army during the war. There are a number of them buried in the National Cemetery in Winchester. Now, while Edward Hall, who rose to the rank of sergeant, survived the war, he died in 1915. About 12% of those who served in USCT regiments with Valley Connections, they paid the ultimate price for freedom. Among those individuals was Jesse Scott, born a slave in Stanton, Virginia. He enlisted in the 43rd USCT in March of 1864. Scott was mortally wounded at the Battle of Petersburg on July 30th, evacuated to the hospital ship Connecticut anchored near Norfolk, and he succumbed to his wound on August 15th of that year. There were other individuals such as William Byrd, a slave who hailed from Rockingham County, enlisted in the 25th USCT and perished from pneumonia on March 22nd, 1864. Throughout four years of conflict then, the Valley's enslaved population and free Blacks, they negotiated at times what really seems to us in the present an almost impossible world. It was one that was filled with hardship, heartache, uncertainty, and seemingly insurmountable obstacles. Of the Confederate surrender at Appomattox reached the Shenandoah Valley's African-American community. Those individuals who left rare accounts, they rejoiced. A formerly enslaved 
uh, female from Middletown, Virginia, explained simply that she was glad when she heard that the war was over. Because war's end meant that the Valley's African Americans no longer had to navigate that world of being in Union territory one day, Confederate territory the next, and then in no man's land the other. Confederate surrender also brought with it an end to enslaved people having to determine the best time to flee, weighing the consequences of escape, again, not only for themselves, but for family and friends who might ultimately have been left behind. However, although they were understandably glad, as that one uh, individual from Middletown noted, although they were glad that uh, Union success brought so much hope and promise with it, I think the Valley's African Americans quickly realized, as they had elsewhere, that although Union triumph, one which they played a critical role in, marked the constitutional death of slavery, it illuminated those many, many wartime challenges. The post-war era brought a whole new set of trials. So the Civil War's end then proved not a conclusion, but merely marked the beginning of the next chapter in the campaign to realize freedom's totality. So with that, I'm going to bring my remarks this evening to a close and open it up for, for some Q&A. And again, I just wanted to, to let you know that my remarks this evening, this is just kind of scratching the surface of so many um, fascinating aspects that are discussed in my book. And I will share very quickly, since you made it to the end, this is your reward. Um, University Press of Florida um, is offering a discount so the book, and I don't set the price for books, um, the press does, it retails for $85, but if you use that code AAIH21 and directly from the press, it will only cost $35. So what a bargain, right? Um, so with that, does anyone have any questions for me this evening? And you can, you can unmute yourself.